Okay, um, we'll get started now. Um, uh, hello everyone, um, my name is Ali and um, uh, I'm a student here at Stanford. Uh, I also uh, have the pleasure of teaching uh, the one unit C++ class uh, that we offer called uh, CS106L. Uh, and it's basically uh, a class that uh, over 10 weeks covers uh, industry level standard C++ programming uh, and all those sort of concepts related to uh, real-world C++. So um, today, um, I think Marty and Ashley um, were kind enough to let me lecture today and uh, because they see the value in covering the sort of importance behind learning actual C++ on top of the concepts you've learned in this class. So today we're just sort of going to uh, get a like wide overview of C++ and how it looks in real life and sort of the concepts you can take away so that if you do encounter C++ code in real life, uh, you'll know how to sort of uh, navigate your way around it. So uh, the game plan for today, um, we're going to start with just a quick introduction on what we're doing today. Um, and then we're going to dive right into some advanced C++ features like templates, uh, we're going to talk about the standard C++ collections, which are sort of the analogs of vector, map, uh, and set, and all that uh, in actual C++. Uh, and then we're going to talk about this thing called iterators and algorithms, um, some other neat features if we get time. Uh, and then we're going to try and look at uh, actual C++ code in the wild. So we're going to find some repository that's interesting and kind of look at um, how that code looks and if we can like parse it in any sort of way. Okay, so um, uh, before we begin, uh, I do want to give a disclaimer. Uh, everything you learned today, please do not use in your final exam uh, because um, we sort of spent 10 weeks going over these concepts and learning the nuances because like, you can shoot yourself in the foot really easily. So uh, sort of take this as a, as a guide to the future as opposed to what you should use for your exams. Okay, so don't use any of these things. Okay, so before we begin, uh, I thought uh, it would be a good idea to sort of take a moment and think about uh, where you've come and you know, what you have done over the course of this 10 weeks. Um, if you remember your sort of first lecture in 106B, you were told, uh, you know, you pound include IO stream, you have this int main thing, you see out hello world, and then it prints hello world for some reason. Something's called endo for some reason, right? And then you've come all this way where now you have a thorough understanding of all these incredible programming concepts like uh, recursion, uh, graph algorithms, you know how to use vectors and maps and linked lists, you know how to manage memory uh, using the stack and the heap. You know, all these like really incredible things which if you think about it, um, it's astounding that you've sort of mastered in 10 weeks, right? So. Um, at the end of 106B, it's important to realize that in this class you've learned like all these useful, incredible ideas which aren't actually computer science specific in any way, in that you know, you're learning how to solve problems in a systematic way. You're learning how to solve problems using computers in a systematic way. Now, in any sort of problem you might try solving, there's sort of, I think, two to three things you need. Um, a professor of mine used to say this to me. Um, so, so you need to understand how to solve problems, and you all have that down. By the end of this class, you know how to solve problems. Um, you need to have a good idea or a good problem you want to solve. And then the last thing you need in computer science is a programming language to solve it in. So the point of 106B is to learn the hard, challenging concept, which is how to solve problems. But what happens is a lot of students leave this class having a really thorough understanding of programming, but uh, maybe like they don't have a standard language to program in, and then they go into interviews, they write vector with a capital V, and then uh, <laughs> their interviewer's like, what's that, uh, right? And it shouldn't matter, but some interviewers, uh, some interviews do uh, make a big deal of it. So, so the kind of focus of 106L in this class is going to be the programming language of uh, that those three steps, basically. Okay, so, <clears throat> so before we begin, maybe it's a good idea to talk about why we should learn about C++. So I'll go through this kind of quickly. But um, 
C++ is this really great language that lets you like program in whatever way you want. If you want to do object oriented, you can do that. If you want to use it like C, you can do that. There's very functional paradigms in C++ too. But in, in general, like it's a, just a really popular language. It's like a, a list of most popular languages by this index that's compiled. C++ is always in the top five. Um, it's uh, one of the most loved languages on Stack Overflow. Uh, it's used in an incredibly vast like array of companies. You can see a bunch of big names there. Um, it's used basically for every browser that's written. Uh, it's used in software. It's used to implement Java's runtime, actually. So uh, that's a fun fact. Um, and you know, it's used in games and other really cool systems-related things. So it is really like a incredible language to try and learn. So I'm going to kind of motivate what kind of cool features we have today. Okay. <clears throat> if at any time you have questions, please feel free to stop me. I'm going to go. We have way more material today in my slides than I think we can cover because it's 10 weeks of a class kind of condensed into one. So uh, we can go at whatever pace you feel like going at. Okay. Cool. So <clears throat> um, we're going to start off by talking about this really cool C++ feature called <laughs> templates. Um, and we're going to start by motivating this idea with a problem. So we're going to see a problem that people experienced when using C++, which led to the introduction of this feature. Okay, so, <clears throat> so here's like this scenario, here's the, the game we're going to play. So let's say you're doing sort of your programming along and you decide for some reason you need a minimum function that uh, takes two integers and returns the smaller of the two integers. It's like a reasonable thing to do that comes up from time to time. Right, so how you would write this function, well, uh, you would have a function that takes uh, an int a and an int b, and then uh, if this notation is not familiar, uh, it's fine. It just says if a is less than b, return a, otherwise return b. Okay, so just doing that concisely because I didn't have space on my slides. Okay, <clears throat> so really reasonable. Uh, we use this function, we could pass it min of 3 and 5, it would tell us 3 is the minimum uh, of 13 and 8, it would give uh, 8. So what happens if we pass it the min of uh, 1.9 and 3.7? What is going to happen when we do that? So this is a function that takes two integers and we're passing it two doubles. What does it do to those integers? Anyone? There. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it truncates them, right? It runs them down to integers, so it gets one and three, and then returns a smaller one, which is one. Right? So this is kind of an issue, and you decide, okay, <clears throat> well, I also want to find the minimum of double, doubles, so what do I do? Well, uh, maybe I'll go and write another function that takes two doubles instead. So um, in sort of a C world, what you would do is you'd have two functions with the same name but different argument types. And then depending on what arguments you pass it, it'll decide which one to call. Right? So if I, if I call min with two doubles, it'll call the second one. If I pass min with two ints, it'll call the first one. Okay? And you could sort of keep doing this for other types. You know, you could have a min of ints, a min of doubles, a min of size t's, a min of floats, a min of characters, a min of strings. You know, at, at some point, you, you have to really stop and say, like, okay, this is not a reasonable programming model for what I'm trying to do. Okay? So <clears throat> the issue with sort of doing something like this is that um, you have basically these multiple copies of exactly the same function, uh, where the only difference is the type of the variables um, and every time you want to add a new type, you need to add. You need to go ahead and copy paste that function, change the type to whatever type you want. Um, and if you edit the function even slightly, let's say you want like less than or equal to rather than less than, you have to go to each of these and sort of replace the less than with the less than or equal to, right? So it's not a very like stable way of programming, especially if you have more complicated methods. And so the idea. Um, in C++, well, the designers were like, what is really different in code like this? So if we sort of look at this, what is the like fundamental difference between all these implementations? Sorry? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
um, okay, so yeah, like the, the, the main difference, if you, if you look at it, is um, just the type, right? Uh, it seems like the type is the only thing that changes between this function. So, if only like there were a better way to do this, this sort of uh, blueprinting of a function with some sort of generic type. And, and that's kind of what the idea of templates in C++ are. Um, templates are really just a blueprint of a function uh, that lets you use this exact function for like different types. So, <coughs> um, thinking about how we wrote all our min functions, we only changed the type. So, uh, if you look, we had our min function, all we did was uh, replace the int with a double, and then we had uh, the other version of it. So, the idea with templates in C++ is we're going to give uh, the compiler this template function uh, and tell it what specific parts, what specific types should be general and should be replaced when we use it in a specific way. So, um, the way this looks is, let's say we have our minimum function again on int, and what we're going to do is make this a general template function. So rather than having ints, we're going to say, make it some generic type T. You could call it whatever you want. I'm just going to call it capital T. Okay? And then all you have to do is tell the compiler T is a generic type. And so just by doing these two things, you now have a min function that will work on any type, basically. Okay, and that's really powerful if you think about it. So uh, just as an example of how you would use this, um, let's say we've written this min function as it is. Um, you can indicate the type of the function you want to call uh, by specifying it in angle brackets. So let's say I have two integers and I want to find the minimum of these two integers using my template function. I would say min with the type int uh, replacing the template parameter and call that function on a and b, right? And if I had double, I could do the same thing. I could call min with the template parameter being type double and then call a and b, okay? Uh, and so um, how this literally works, which is like sort of an interesting question too, is that uh, let's say you're the compiler and you're looking at this code and you're on this line you say, okay, the user declared two ints, an int a equals three and a b equals nine, that's fine, I can do that. And then the compiler gets to this line and it says, I don't have a min int function. No one ever defined a min int function anywhere. But I do know how to make one. Someone told me, gave me a cookie cutter template of how this function should look for any type. So I just have to go and like replace that type with this type and that will give me the function I want. So what it does is like literally in a very literal sense, it takes this template function and then generates this function from it. Uh, with the type T replaced with int, okay? Uh, and so uh, when you use this, actually, uh, most of the time you can leave out the angle brackets too because it infers from the type of the parameters what version you're calling most of the time. So you really have like something that looks like a min function but works for any type. Any questions about this so far? Sorry? Yeah, so the question is what happens if we call like min on say 3 and 2.9? So you have different type parameters, which one will it use? That's a very good question. So um, either like sort of two reasonable guesses. One is it's going to convert one to another type, uh, or the other is it's not going to compile. Um, and actually, it errs on the side of not compiling so that it doesn't do anything unexpected. It'll say ambiguous call could not infer template type or something like that. It's a very good question. Yep. Yeah, so that's a very good question as well. Uh, the question is, uh, if we go back to this function here, uh, what if we pass in two types that don't have a comparison operator? Will this compile or will it not? Um, and so the answer to that is in like two slides, but uh, in short, it's not going to compile. So um, <clears throat> the thing with uh, template functions, and this is a, a great point, is that um, there's this sort of implicit idea that any type you instantiate your template for should be able to do everything you, you use it for uh, in the method. So in this, in this method, we were uh, comparing two types, right? Um, 
And so if you pass it a type that can't be compared, it won't compile. In the same way, if we were incrementing one of the types in that generic method, if you pass it a type that doesn't have an increment operator, then it won't compile as well. So that's something called the implicit interface of the template, which is that uh, the only types valid to use with a templatized function uh, are those that satisfy its implicit interface, which is basically uh, if you replace this type t uh, with the actual type you want to use, would the code compile? And, and if it does, it will compile. If it doesn't, it won't. Okay? And this is actually an important point. It will relate to something we'll talk about in a bit. Okay. Any other questions about templates? That's also a really good question. Um, there is actually, and it sort of amounts to this hacky thing where you do something to the type in the method that would only work on certain types, and so it won't compile for the other types. It roughly amounts to that, but in like more elegant way. But yeah, you can, definitely. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Okay, so, let's check the time. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, one, sort of question for, for you all is, um, no. so um, where have you seen this kind of notation before, where you have like these angle brackets and then you're telling it a type or something? Anyway, is that a half? Yeah. Yeah, so when you make a vector or a map, you also do something like this, right? You say vector, angle bracket int or vector, angle back bracket string. If you've ever wondered how that works, the idea is exactly the same as template functions, except it's called templatized classes. Um, and, and, uh, and what that looks like is basically, um, just like how we generalize functions to any type, you can also generalize classes to any type in almost the exact same way. There are a few more quirks to the implementation, but it's the same idea morally. Um, so, for example, uh, what we're going to look at today is you wrote this array stack class uh, a few weeks ago uh, when you first learned about memory management, and we're going to talk about how you could make that array stack work not just for integers, but for any type. So, <clears throat> you had this array stack class which had a push uh, method and then some other methods, right? And so, I'm going to show you how you would templatize this uh, class so that rather than only operating on ints, it's going to operate on any type. And the, the idea is similar. So firstly, we have our .h file and then our .cpp file. Uh, and I'm only looking at one of the functions right now. But OK, so the first thing you do is what we did with functions, where you replace the int with a generic, generic type, let's say t or value type. I, I call it value type because I think it's a clearer name. OK? <laughs> and then you just tell the compiler that value type is a generic type by adding this line at the start of the class. Say it's templatized over this type called value type. Okay? <clears throat> and then uh, you have to sort of do the same thing in the CPP file. You have to firstly change uh, the array stack object to be array stack value type. And then above this function implementation, you also have to say value type is a templatized type. So it's kind of annoying where like for each function you have to prefix it with template type name value type and then change array stack to array stack value type. Okay, so um, I guess there's a typo because this should also be value type, uh, but ignore that. Okay, and then the last thing you have to do, which is kind of annoying and doesn't make sense, is to move all the cpp file to the end of the .h file and delete the cpp file. So for some reason, the way templates and compilation in C++ work, you, you can't have template code split between interface and implementation. They have to be in the same .h file at once. So if you've ever looked at Stanford's collections, all the vector, map, and int stuff are in the .h files, and there's no CPP file for them. OK. Cool. So um, yeah, so I thought it would be fun if we just sort of look at this array stack uh, code and then just templatize it a little or completely, I guess. So just as a refresher, we had an array stack, which was uh, a stack backed by an, a heap allocated array. So we had an array of uh, ints called elements. It has a size and capacity. And we had this like push, pop, peak, is empty, and two string methods. So um, how this is being used is we have a main function 
that uh, I guess this shouldn't be there. So we have a main function that uh, creates an array stack, pushes some integers into it, and this prints some things. Okay. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to make this work so that we could push. So right now, if I do stack dot push, uh, let's say a string, it's not going to compile because it says uh, you're trying to insert a string where it's expecting an int, right? So this is not a generic stack, stack, it only works for ints. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the .h file and then templatize this. So what we're going to say is uh, this is a templatized class uh, and it is templatized over this type called value type. Okay, and then so let's let's do this sort of interactively. What should I change to a value type here? Should this be a value type? Anything in this method? Yep. Yeah, so the int needs to be a value type because now it's operating on a generic type. Okay, what about pop? Okay, so int, it should return a value type. Peak should return a value type. This should still be bool because it's just checking if it's empty. This will still be a string. Over here, we don't want an array of ints anymore. We want an array of value types. And then size and capa oh, shit. <laughs> Ashley, is there an outlet here? Okay. 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 Anyways, um, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so, so we've templatized based on value type, and I think those are all the changes you need to make here, um, except we now have to go to the CPP file and make these changes too. So if we go to the CPP file, uh, we have all these things. So remember, we need to templatize each one and then say it is not an array stack, but an array stack of value types. So rather than in the array stack class, it's in the array stack value type class. And then we want to copy this template thing above each of them too. So I'll do this really quickly. Do, do, do. Do, do. Okay. And then template. Template. Okay. Cool. And that's almost it. We just have to do uh, one more thing, which is uh, so sorry. These should be value types. Do, 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 do. Value type, value type, value type. Okay. And what we have to do is move all this code uh, to the CPP file, so uh, to the H file. So we'll just go to the bottom after the class is declared, and just throw that in there. Okay. And then we'll just delete all of this, and maybe delete the file. Okay. And now the code is compiling, but sorry. Yeah. Oh, does it? Oh, yes. Oh, perfect. Right, right, right. Value type result. Right, perfect. Yep. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, and it does compile at this point, but it's giving an error saying use of template array stack requires template arguments. So because now we've generalized it in main, we can't just say array stack stack, we need to say array stack int stack. And then it'll compile and it'll work um, supposedly in the same way it was before. Okay? Cool. So any questions about that? Okay, great. So that's basically... Uh, templatized classes in a, in a nutshell. There's some details where you have to move everything to a .h file and then prefix everything with template type name and some weird syntax, but this is roughly the idea. So if you go to uh, Stanford Library Collections, let's say vector.h, what's the first thing you see? It's templatized of a value type uh, and it has a constructor and all these things and the implementation is in the h file. So it's really like things you can understand, okay? Cool. So that's sort of one topic. Now we're going to move to the next topic. Okay. So, so um, you've been using these things called uh, vectors, uh, stacks, maps, and queues your whole life, or at least ten weeks, I guess. Um, uh, yeah. Um, and and so um, I just wanted to point out that 
these are like very real world concepts in C++, in standard C++, those exact collections exist more or less. So there's the standard C++ library which has a set of classes and algorithms. So it has these container classes called lowercase vector, lowercase map, lowercase set. Uh, and these algorithms sort, find, which we'll talk about for uh, in a second. And, and the Stanford C++ collection acts almost like the standard ones, except, um, you know, the standard C++ collections are really, really unfriendly if you're just starting off programming. So uh, just simple examples, if you go out of range on a vector, uh, it's not going to crash. Uh, it will just go out of range and, you know, maybe it'll crash because you corrupt your memory or it'll just work and you'll never know. So, so the standard C++ collections do effectively what the underlying uh, standard C++ collections do, except they have better error messages and they're simpler to use. Uh, and it's because like, if you're C++ programming, there's sort of a paradigm you need to adopt. And we don't want to waste time and be teaching you that paradigm when you should be focusing on learning the concepts. So <clears throat> just sort of a summary. So we have Stanford on the left, standard on the right. There's no graph class in the STL, in the standard library. Uh, there's no grid. There is a hash map. It's called unordered map, hash set, unordered set. Vector is lowercase vector, linked list is lowercase list, map, map, set, set. Okay. Uh, we also have priority queue, which is lowercase priority queue and all that. So there's like this trend where lowercase in the letter is usually uh, what exists in the standard library. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and just sort of there's some method differences too, but they aren't huge, but I have a reference here if anyone wants to look at it in their own time. So we have Stanford vector on the left, standard vector on the right. Everything looks the same except this. Instead of calling dot add to put something to the end, you call dot push back because you're pushing to the back of the vector. Um, you call um, to get an element, the standard vector bounce checks by default. Standard vector doesn't. If you call v dot at, it will bounce check. Um, and then it's the same thing with inserting. And then you have sort of basically everything else the same. So like biggest takeaway in an interview, don't call that ad, call it, call that pushback. You look like, you know, super fast and it'll be great. Okay. So uh, just as an example, we have um, uh, just code using the Stanford vector and we're going to like convert it. The first thing we need to do is lowercase the V include us. So we have to include the standard vector, which is with angle brackets because it's a library vector. We lowercase the v, we change the dot add to dot push back. Um, and notice we had v dot insert at index zero, the value 42. And now we have v dot insert something called v dot begin, and then the value 42, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, and in Stanford vector, you have um, v dot remove with the value two. <laughs> Uh, at index two, and then in the standard vector, you have v dot erase, and then again this begin thing, and then plus two for some reason, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay. So any questions about the standard collections at all? I know I'm really rushing through these things, but I want to get like a breadth of things. So. <clears throat> okay. Great. So. So um. What's next? Okay. So. Let's talk about these things called iterators. Um, all my L students are laughing because this is like 10 weeks, <laughs> literally we're at week four or five right now. So, um, okay, so let's talk about iterators and what these are. Um, so again, it's worth talking about these by motivating a problem that led to their invention. Okay, so <clears throat> what iterators are uh, motivated by is this idea is like, how do you iterate or how do you loop through an associative container. Uh, an associative container is a map or a set or some like unordered collection, which is like not a vector. It doesn't have an inherent idea of ordering. How do you loop through those containers? So with a vector, when you loop through it, you have indices int i equals zero, i less than v dot size, i plus plus. But with like a map or a set or something, what, what, what sort of... Uh, notion exists to do that. Well, you can't set i equal to anything like the zeroth element because it's not really ordered in any way. Um, you can't check what i is less than because there's not really an end element because it's not a sequential container. So um, like what do we do with this problem? And so <clears throat> C++ had this really neat solution, which was like, let's take indices and sort of abstract them 
into a more general setting that will work on all containers, regardless of what the underlying container is. So the idea is we're going to try and behave like indices do, but work more generally uh, in cases where like indices wouldn't normally work. So the idea is um, an iterator or iterators are these generalizations of indices that store position within whatever collection you're at. And you can move them forward. You can compare whether you're at the end. You can get the start one. And they allow you to traverse over any collection uh, is the idea. <clears throat> so um, sort of the mental model of iterators is like you have some collection. And like think of it as a cloud. Because not every collection is a sequence. So a more general way of thinking about a collection is some cloud of things. Okay, and, and the idea of iterators is they let you view this um, non-linear collection in sort of a linear manner, somehow. So, um, yeah, the, the question uh, you might be asking is how does this magical great thing work? Uh, my answer to you is uh, we don't care right now because we're going to trust that they work because we're going to let the abstraction of iterators do their thing. We're just going to learn how to use them. And if you want to learn how to implement them, take one or six seconds. Okay. So, so we'll just use them for now. But the idea is, is pretty intuitive. If you keep in mind, we're trying to behave like indices, but work more generally. So let's say you have a collection, and the iterators are letting you view this collection in a linear manner. So if you had indices, you'd say, Get me, let me start at the zeroth index. Well, if you have iterators, you say, let me start at the begin iterator. So you call your collection's variable name dot begin, and it'll give you an iterator pointing to the start of the sequence. Um, and you want to store this in some sort of variable. So uh, you'll store it in some variable called iter iter, and it has some type. And that type is actually defined in the class that you're using. So if my set is a vec is a set of ints, then um, in the set int class there's an iterator type that you will refer to when you want an iterator. So uh, just to recap, you're getting the zeroth index iterator, the beginning iterator, and storing it in a variable. And the type of this iterator is this thing defined in the class. Okay. So what this looks like is that um, you have an iterator pointing to your zeroth index, your begin. Right? Now, if you want to get what's actually at the end of this iterator, so this iterator is referring to something, you want to get what this iterator is referring to, uh, you dereference it with the star operator. So if I want to print uh, the current value of iter, I would do C out star iter and o. Okay, and that'll print the one. Okay. Now I, what do I want to do? I want to move to the next thing in my collection, right? So I advance my iterator by calling plus plus on it. So I say plus plus iter, it will move to the next one. And then I can again uh, print it by dereferencing it, and they'll print the two. I can advance it, print it, advance it, uh, print it. And then somehow I need to be able to check if I've reached the end, right? So if we're modeling indices, we have zero, and then we have i less than v dot size. Or we want to make sure, we want to stop when we've reached one past the end of our collection. So with iterator, you can do the exact same thing there's something called the end iterator that you can compare yourself to. And the end iterator is one past the end of your collection. So, so uh, you can terminate by saying, if my iter is, my, is at the end iterator, then stop. Okay? So it really is not behaving any differently to indices, um, but it'll work in a more general setting. And that's the powerful idea here. So <clears throat> sort of um, the summary is you can create iterators, do reference them, advance them, and compare them. Now, if any of you are wondering, this looks a lot like a pointer. Um, the idea with iterators was, let's try and make them look like pointers. Now, uh, you know, it's worth asking why anyone on Earth would want something to look like a pointer if it doesn't need to be. But uh, the idea was, like, programmers were very familiar with the idea of pointers. So they made iterators, the syntax of iterators, to look and behave like pointers would. Because all pointers are iterators, but not all iterators are pointers. Yeah is the idea. Okay, <clears throat> cool. So sort of looking at code, if you had a vector in V, you added stuff to it, how you would loop through it in a for loop. So normally, if you had a vector, you'd have for int i equals 0, i less than v dot size plus plus i. 
Now you have vector int iterator. The type is the iterator in the vector in class. Start it off at v.begin, our zeroth iterator. Keep going until we hit the end iterator and increment it each time. Okay? Any questions about this? Okay, so cool. So sort of some more things about iterators. Um, most standard, actually every standard collection has iterators that you can use. Even vector, which you can index into, it is suggested you use iterators for. So when you operate on vector and you call insert or erase, you don't tell it what index to insert to or what index to erase from, you tell it what iterator to erase. So that's why we had v.begin plus two when we were removing at the second element rather than uh, v.erase two. Okay. Um, and so just a sort of quick question for you to ponder. Um, given what we know about templates and this implicit interface where a template will compile if whatever type you pass it can call those methods in the template function, um, do you gain a lot by having the standard interface of iterators? Um, and sort of what might be something there. So I'm not gonna, it's just something for you to ponder. What do we gain from having a standard interface of iterators? Okay, um, okay. <clears throat> so this leads directly into this next idea where in C++ you also have these things called algorithms which um, are basically like a programmer's dream. It's like, like some really intelligent people sat down and implemented all these algorithms and they'll work on any class that has iterators, right? So uh, the sort of the motivation of algorithms was, um, let's say I, wanna, I want a sort function. Okay, I could write a sort function that will take a vector of int and sort it. Or I could write a sort function that'll take an iterator start and an iterator end, sort everything in that range. Now this sort method will work for vectors, lists. It'll work for, uh, I guess, any collection that provides iterators, more or less. Okay, so <clears throat> with standard algorithms, they operate on iterators, and they let them, that lets them work on a lot of types, sorry. Um, and they rely heavily on templates. So um, here's a list of all algorithms. So there's some really useful ones. So standard copy, which copies from one iterator range into another. You have uh, standard equal, it checks if, everything, if the range is equal to something. Um, you have um, max element, which returns the max element in an iterator range. Um, you have, um, I don't know, let's see, yeah, other things. Um, I have like this fun story of uh, algorithms where I was in a programming interview uh, and, the, and the person was like, yeah, so it, there, he was asking about something about some sort of modified binary search where you don't want to find an element, you want to find the greatest element less than or equal to something. Right, so like the greatest, uh, the, the least upper bound of a given element. And it's like a modified binary search that you can do. And I, and I did it in one line, because there's an algorithm called uh, standard upper bound that does exactly that. And the programmer and uh, the interviewer was like, I have no idea how that works. And I was like, it's, it's n log n, it does, uh, it's, uh, it's log n, it does a binary search. And he was like, yeah, okay, cool, <laughs> let's move on, right? <laughs> so really, when you like master algorithms, Programming in C++ is like incredible. So if you like ever look at like the international programming competition or something, almost always the top team uses C++ because what do they have to do? Well, they write a collection, provide iterators for it, and then they can use these algorithms on it uh, perfectly without having to do anything on top. It really is a powerful concept. Okay, so um, we might not have time to actually go through um, some of these algorithms, but um, I definitely encourage you to look through them. Any questions so far? It doesn't need to be something specific. If you have just like a general question around these topics, I'll take that too. Okay, okay cool. So, <clears throat> so that's sort of, um, week six of 106L. Um, and, and now, um, I think, just to sort of close off, uh, we can talk about some other neat features that are really cool. So the first thing I want to talk about, and again, disclaimer, don't use this in your final exam. People have done it before and it hasn't worked out great. So, so just, just, just compartmentalize this outside of 106B. 
So a really neat feature in C++ is this thing called auto, <laughs> which is, um, which is um, it's, this, it's this really cool C++ feature that lets you uh, type deduce the type of a variable. So the idea is, um, if the type of a variable is obvious, right? So I have int x equals 3. You're saying x equals 3. It's obvious that 3 is an int. So I could probably tell the compiler to figure out that the type of x is int. So what I can do is write something like auto x equals 3, and the compiler will figure out that the type of x is an int. Uh, and so um, I'll show some examples of using it. But uh, you shouldn't abuse this, but you should use it as much as possible in real life, not in your final. Um, and and um, the idea is like whenever the type of something is really obvious, uh, you should use auto. Um, and there are also some places in C++ that's kind of advanced, but uh, you don't know the type at compile time. Uh, and so uh, you use auto there too. Okay, <clears throat> so just so, sort of an example. Uh, you could have auto x equals 3, and uh, the compiler will say, okay, x is like an int. I can figure that out at compile time. You can say auto v set equals graph to get vertex set, and they'll figure out that v set is a set of vertex stars by looking at the signature of the get vertex set function. Um, and sort of the most useful place of auto, I think, is like in iterators, you saw that the type of the iterator was this like ghastly thing where you had like set int colon colon iterator and that was the type right so uh, it's also very nice to be able to do auto it equals vector begin so this is the most common use case um, of iterators of, of auto i think okay so um one sort of side note related to this um in cs106b how have you been uh looping through through a set for example This is just a question you should be able to answer, hopefully. Yeah. yeah, so you had something, I think, let's say you had a set int the uh, 3 on 4, OK. Let me just include set.h. OK. So, so, so far, when you've had a set, how you loop through it is what you said was for int x in, let's call this s. Uh, for int, or uh, let's call it um, my set. So for int x in my set, uh, let's say c out x, right? And uh, that does this thing where it prints. Uh, do, do, do. Sorry. Do, do, do. Okay. So <clears throat> that does. Oh, God damn it. So, um, okay, so it does this thing where it prints. Prints. No. Okay. Uh, do, do. Okay. It's printing down here for whatever reason, but ignore that. Okay. So um, it prints everything in a set. So actually, this thing is shorthand for sort of the iterator code. So actually, before we do anything, how would you write this with iterators? Well, you'd say for auto it equals my set dot begin. So for i equals zero, but on a set now, uh, it not equal to my set dot end. Uh, advance it and c out or let's say uh, int x equals the thing it is pointing to and let me see out x okay. so if i run both this code this code this code it uh, prints the same thing twice and actually this for each loop does exact it is syntactic sugar for this like cool thing over here it's just a shorthand for it so actually the stanford set and stanford map provide iterators, which is what lets you do something like this. So if you provide iterators to your collection, you can use this uh, notation, uh, and it will compile and loop through. So the for each loop is shorthand for this whole thing that we talked about. OK? So <clears throat> another thing that we probably won't talk too much about is uh, we have this thing called lambdas, which are inline functions in C++. It's really neat uh, once you get used to them. Uh, these exist in a lot of languages, but uh, the idea is basically that you can make functions on the fly. Instead of declaring them as a function, you can make them a variable. Uh, so it sort of looks like this. Forget what the capture list is for this class, but you have the parameters of the function, an arrow, and then the return type, and then you just write the function like you normally would. So as an example, 
you have a print int function that, um, forget the capture list, it takes an integer parameter. Um, it has return type void, so you can leave the return type out. It see outs xendl and then terminates that function. And so you've stored that function in a variable, and then you can call it like a normal function. You can do this inside like an another function. So it's like really cool. Uh, another example is if you want to use the sort algorithm. So the standard sort algorithm takes an iterator range. So you're saying sort the range v.begin to v.end, and then use this comparison function. You can pass it a comparison function that given two ints says um, that um, sort them based on the fact that i is greater than j. The first one is uh, sort them in reverse order, basically. Okay, so <clears throat> these uh, actually exist in almost every modern language. So they exist in Python, definitely, uh, JavaScript, um, Java even, God forbid, uh, and then C++. Uh, so really cool uh, advanced C++ topic. Okay, so we have about two minutes, so I just wanted to uh, wrap up by looking at this really cool thing, which is, uh, I was looking for a good example of uh, real C++ code that's like well-written, and as much as I hate to say this, the Bitcoin source code is incredibly well-written, so we're gonna, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I'm not about the hype, but like the, the code is really well-written, so I thought we'd just look at it really quickly and sort of see some of the things we've talked about today. So <clears throat> this is a Bitcoin source code, uh, it's on GitHub, uh, right? And then you go to the SRC folder and you notice lots of C++, so .h and .cpp files. Right, so uh, anyone wanna pick one to look at in particular? Chain.h, coin, what? Okay, let's do coins. So we have coins.h and coins.cpp, so it sounds like it's probably a class. So let's look at coins.h. It's a class that has some other classes in it. Uh, it's initializing some things and it has some methods. It has some templatized functions that will operate on any stream it looks like, whatever that is, um, and some other classes in here. And if we look, uh, look, uh, we have an unordered map, which is a hash map, um, and things like that. If we look at the CPP file, we have the same thing. You're implementing the coins class look it returns an iterator for the coins class, right? So, so um, right, if, I, if iterator is not equal to cache coins.n. So really, like, I'm not bluffing. Like, this is actually as if the code is written. Uh, you don't use indices. You use iterators. You use dot in place and all these ideas. Again, another iterator and so on. So um, I'd encourage you to go kind of, like, look through that on your own. But uh, I think that's it. So thank you.